must tell you that Mary Berry came to one of my talks. <gasps> really? One of the first people to arrive was Mary Berry. She came with an article I'd written on The Telegraph about roses, and I'd mentioned her rose. And I'm so pleased to tell you that when I unfolded it, it had tea stains and bacon stains. So I think oh, her good. husband was involved. Because <laughs> she's, so, she's so pristine, isn't she? Yes. I love Mary Berry. And I think one of the things I've learned is to go to a specialist grower, let them do the pruning. You spend a bit more on a proper fruit tree that's already showing some sort of shape. Hey! We were talking about pruning, you know, and cutting things down. Well, the one that there are certain things that you can't cut down, even though they may look awful. Um, I've got the sage bear garden, which I absolutely love because it's got really large leaves and it's very good in cooking. It's looking very ragged. Penstemons are looking very ragged. Um, Achilles, Achillea moonshine is almost dirty grey. But you can't cut those things down until you really feel spring is on the horizon. And that may be April, you know, before we get convincingly spring weather. Again, I haven't got the crystal ball. Can't can't <laughs> tell you. I am in looking forward to my snowdrops and my hepaticas. And, um, you know, I'm hoping I've got a lot of wonderful ferns. I have been cutting down polysticums and dryopteris um, if, because they're looking shabby and you've cut them down to the brown knuckle. But um, my polypodiums, um, I've got things like Richard Case, they'll get left over summer because they're summer dormant, so they don't produce their new fronds until probably September. And... Polypodium means multi-footed, and what they do is they put out a little foot and then another bit comes up and then they put out another foot. So they make um, clumps, but they leave gaps between the fronds and actually it's very good to get things like snowdrops and scillas coming through them. So they're still looking really good, so obviously I'll leave those. But it's all looking a bit bare in the woodland at the moment, and it's amazing, isn't it, how quickly it changes yes, it once the weather bad. comes. It's like a, a magic act. <laughs> with the ferns, because I, I very much took inspiration from you with my new raised bed last year. And in amidst the snowdrops, I planted a collection of ferns, which Alan very kindly gave me. But last year was my first year of really trying to get stuck into ferns. And I went a bit with too much gusto. I know that will surprise people. And so I can't remember what any of them are called. <laughs> and I... I think when you buy plants sort of one at a time and you research them and you, I take the information in better, I got a bit overwhelmed by my ferns. So I don't really know. I'm learning now from them which ones are evergreen and which ones die back. And, and one or two of them, I think, look quite sort of enthusiastic. And I'm kind of worried that they might crowd the snowdrops out around them. Is that a danger or will the snowdrops just punch well, I mean, through? Well, and we mentioned Christopher Lloyd. Christopher Lloyd always used to cut most of his hardy ferns down. And, you know, the ones that have got the brown knuckles that make the crowns, uh, dryopteris, polystic polysticums. Um, you know, he used to cut those down to the knuckles and then uh, the, the miniature bulbs like snowdrops would flower. And then the, frond, um, the fronds of dryopteris and polysticums always emerge with the bluebells. And you've got the fiddle neck of the dryopteris, a slightly different shape of the polysticum. And they will cover the bulb foliage in about April, May time. So um, it depends on which ferns there were. You'll have to go back to Mr. Gray, but scolopendrium, <laughs> the splenium scolopendriums, the evergreen heart's tongue fern, oh. those get left um, because they're completely evergreen. They need a shady site. Uh, and the poly... Uh, podiums get left but a lot of ferns get cut down now. I think the one I can remember that I was contemplating is possibly Polysticum plumosum densum. Yes that's a, that's a soft shield fern. So that is currently very present it's lovely it's yes. beautiful and I don't want to and touch what it. have you got underneath it? That I, I don't know because that's where the labels have gone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would probably wait, as it's a new plant, a newly planted. I, mine have been in the ground a long time, so they can. I've been taking off the, the fronds now. Um, and, um, you know, I, I'd probably leave it another three or four weeks. I don't know what Alan thinks, uh, because it is a new plant. 
but then you know you'll begin to see those knuckles yeah. beginning to sort yeah. of swell and then cut them off because you know you want those ferns to look pristine and you shouldn't worry about not knowing the names I still don't know a lot of the names of my ferns and when I get experts here um, there's a chap called Gertian van der Kock who've kindly labelled a lot for me and then Martin Rickards and uh, hasn't been here but not for a long time and Angela and it's surprising how they slightly different names appear so I, I think ferns are the hardest thing to learn and I really admire people who can do it but I'm very sketchy on some well, of them. I know what you mean this and the nuance between one variety and another is often quite small as well um, yes it is my, my attitude to ferns is that <clears throat> I don't prune mine until I see the new croziers emerging and when I see those new croziers emerging then I get stuck in but what the one warning is you must be very very careful in how you do this because there's the danger that you could snip off the new crozier and then you've lost a whole year's leave. Yes, well, that's one of the reasons I take mine off now before mm. the crozier moved. Mm. Uh, a, a, because I've got snowdrops round all those polysticums and um, uh, I want them to come up. And if the fern fronds are over them, they're going to sort of, it's going to be very damp down there. So I, I mm. do take mine off at this time of year. Um, but um, it's funny, I've got a lot of polysticums and whenever I see a nice polysticum, because they're, um, they've got very mossy foliage, a lot of the soft shield ferns, not all of them. And um, they do suffer from damp. And we're having such a wet winter that, you know, they, the fronds could get a bit, you know, not mouldy exactly. So that's another reason that I prefer to cut them down. But when I have um, people come to the garden who really love their ferns, they all go for the same two and then they get very cross when I can't tell them the <laughs> name of it because I've just bought, I just buy things, ferns by eye. If yeah. it looks good, I pick it up and I plant it. And I don't always know where I've got it from. But it's funny that I've probably got 25 and they will just home in on the same two polysticums and ask me for a piece. <laughs> and it hasn't made another crown yet. And then they take a frond and trying to get it going by the frond. I don't know whether they ever do. I, uh, I, as part of my foray into ferns last year, I bought a couple of different maidenhair ferns and one of them was much, much finer than the other. Again, great on my fern names. And it Adiantum. Yeah, Adi but I'm, yeah, I don't know which Adiantums. <laughs> but the, the finer one. Pedatum is one, isn't it? Pedatum, yes. And then there's one called a lute, something like a lutoides which is, a, I think, um, a foreign fern. Um, he's going to get on his phone again. Uh, I'm trying to have um, a little look and see if I... A-L-E-U, and then I fade on the rest. Yes. But, I mean, the thing is, I, I bought a magnificent Miss Sharples from um, a fern nursery called Fernatix, and I planted it in my garden, and it was about 15 inches high. Ever since I planted it, it's only been about six inches high because I don't think I'm really warm enough to, and sumptuous enough to get it into. And I feed it and it still never looks any different from any of the others. And, and some of them have got lovely black stems, haven't they? Yeah, they have. Yes. I mean, I've got, I've got one um, that stays green in winter and um, I've got a snowdrop that comes up through it. Um, a green tip snowdrop. It's absolutely beautiful. Is it green of hearts? Yes, green of hearts. That is one of my highlights of spring when that fern um, begins to reshoot. And, and, it, and because it's under a cornus officinalis, it doesn't lose all its foliage. I mean, this is the whole joy of woody plants in woodland gardens, draining the soil, protecting the plants, you know, casting that magic lantern pattern as the sun moves round, you, could, you shouldn't grow these low-lying woodlanders without that supporting cast of shrubby things. And Cornus officinalis is, is a great favourite of mine because it, it has more flower than Cornus mass. I saw it at John Mass's garden and I planted it. And, I, and actually, you know, like a lot of the things in my garden, it's going to outgrow its space. But <laughs> as I'm 73 nearly, I'm not that bothered. <laughs> I think not Somebody else bothered. Could yeah, I yeah. think that's that's a great approach. Yes. Well, whatever my yeah. mystery adiantum is, I'll go and look at the label. It um it lost, it was looking fine until the cold snap. And I suppose I'm just hoping no, it's deciduous. that, yeah, it will that that's up. it and it'll be yes. fine. 
I mean, there's one called Venusta, isn't there, that spreads. Yes. Um, and, and that's a lovely thing. Well, all of mine have got, I mean, my woodland garden, the only things that are really showing are a few um, hellebore buds and some polysticums. And I know that it's all under there, you know, and that's one of the reasons I got on and tidied it when I noticed all the snowdrops coming up because I don't want to walk on it, mm. you know, any later than, I, than now because so much is under the ground. And it's going to be amazing. So many wooden enemies in there. And there are tremendous fillers in a woodland garden, especially if it's a bit moist. And Robin Soniana is absolutely wonderful with its sort of lilac flowers and slightly darker backs. And the nodding flowers of wooden enemies, they suit a spring day so wonderfully well. You know, quite different to the anemone blanders, which are growing in brighter parts of my garden. Um, uh, the nodding wooden enemies are, are just wonderful. Uh, and, and they'll probably be out by mid-March. I can't wait. I get so impatient at this time of the year. Things that happen. Do you remember when Jonathan Ross got into trouble with the BBC because he said that his son wanted something to happen and it could a fire engine or a police... I was like that as a child. I used to think, why can't something happen? <laughs> Mind you, let's not wish March, March here too quickly because then my life will be very busy and, you know, I could do with yes. a little bit more prep time. So, yes, yes. <laughs> you'll be fine, Thordis. You'll be fine. <laughs> uh, this chat, as ever, is just so inspiring. And I think anybody, we're already feeling this kind of glee at the season and all of the things coming through. I think hearing you talk about all of your favourites in your garden has just increased that feeling of promise so much. Yes. Um, um, yeah, I'm even more excited now than I already yes, was. Christmas is so over. Yeah. <laughs> we had 20 Christmas cards, you know, in the, in the early days of January, you know, because of the postal strike. Yes. Thought, this is so over. <laughs> it's funny. One minute, there you are. Although we do have Christmas cake left. <laughs> I think you've probably, as ever, given people a ton of FLOMO. Actually, before we come on to FLOMO, oh, I, just, yes. I just want to mention um, a plant you had given me FLOMO about, the Clematis freckles, which I'd always yes. meant to buy um, yes. and somehow hadn't. And then last Christmas, I got bought a Clematis and I'm fairly certain it was labelled as something like Jingle Bells. So it been bought as a sort of Christmas theme, yes. Yes. Uh, Christmas present. And... Um, and I was really grateful for it. But in my heart of hearts, secretly, a little bit disappointed it wasn't freckles. And then it flowered this year, amazingly abundantly, and it seems to be freckles. So thank wow. you to the gardening well, gods freckles, yes, yes. <laughs> for replacing the jingle bells in my pot with the freckles and getting it mislabeled <laughs> at the nursery because that is exactly what I wanted. And it has been absolutely wonderful. It is. I mean, mine flowered in November and, you know, and, and I, it's um, you can see it through one of the windows and it, and it comes over um, a tree peony and it's like little um, putty coloured Tiffany lamps. And then you go out and you lift the flowers and they're so spotted in bright red. It's a real in November needs plants like that. It really does. Well, I'm wondering if this is what I've got, because I have a similar looking clematis. I, it came without a name. It was a gift from somebody. And I planted it in a very sheltered uh, east facing corner, east and south facing corner um, with a wall behind it. Um, and I've got that and it's climbing through a Lapageria rosea. Yes. And you hardly notice the clematis because the Lapagerias, I mean, they've got buds, uh, flowers on about three or four inches long, lovely waxy. Yes. Bright. You turn up the clematis flowers and then there's this, this network of lurid coloured sort of purpley veins inside oh i don't think it's veined freckles it's more spotted more da oh, it's more like somebody's got some teacher's ink and thrown yeah, it sure. yes yeah i could throw in my teacher's ink a few times i'll tell you <laughs> <laughs> i bet you could <laughs> while we're on the subject of clematis i'm going to put you on the spot alan and ask if um if nepalen because i think i bought you clematis nepalensis you did buy me Nepal nepalensis last year you haven't got a flower out on it yet but it's, it's alive. alive it's alive yes but they're, they're slow they're slow fused things those winter flowering evergreen clematis but once they're going they're toughies yeah, yeah. i i think i saw 
um, probably was Brian Ellis again. I, he's always an inspiration. Saw that he had an epilensis in his garden and thought maybe I just need to get it. I, that, funnily enough, is a plant I hadn't got in case it wasn't hardy, but it seems to be. So um, as the name might suggest, I suppose, nepalensis. Yes. <laughs> well, again, it's fighting that climate thing, isn't it? Because Nepalese plants, um, you know, will be getting that uh, dry winter, cold, dry winter, and then, you know, summer rain. Yeah. And I think I'd struggle to grow that here. I haven't tried it. I should try it. Although I'm running out of room now. But there's always a space to squeeze another one yeah. in. When did that ever stop? Yes. Us? And anyone yes. who doesn't no. know Nepalensis, sort of cream bells with lovely purpley stamen. Are they stamens? Yes, I think so. Uh, um, I haven't grown Nepalensis. So I find it... I, I, I'm I'm a sort of because I don't know whether it's because I was an infant teacher. I'm a first-hand person. I only talk about things that I've grown. I only write about things that I've grown. I'm not, and, and I'm very sketchy on things I haven't grown. I don't read other people's stuff much, but I <laughs> you know so I can't be I can't be that helpful on Nepalensis. Well, here we go. I got the wrong word, but I'm going to describe. I'm going to use Thorncroft and their description to do justice. The greenish cream nodding bell-shaped flowers have long reddish pink anthers. The foliage is wintergreen. It has a period of dormancy in the summer when it can lose its leaves. So, but the flowers, I just think they're extraordinary and they look so exotic. That's one thing about um, these uh, winter green clematis. You don't prune them, you can tidy them a little. And then we have um, um, Cirrhosa variety balearica on the south side of our cottage. And it will always lose its leaves at some stage. And it looks very dead, but it comes back. So, you know, it's not dead, it's just having a rest. <laughs> a Spanish siesta, because it is a Spanish... Uh, is a Spanish species. <laughs> there we go. Squeeze some clematis in ahead of Flomo, which, of course, um, it, if you've never seen one of these podcasts before, is that fear of missing out you get about a plant. You are undoubtedly having some of that after Val's wonderful chat over the last hour or so. Um, I've got a couple of Flomos inspired by my special plant seed list, which turned up in the post over the last Ooh, yes. week. I forgot to bring it over. It's on the kitchen table. But... Um, I I mean most of it let's be honest most of the things on the on the seed list probably Flomo if you don't grow them on a a sort of easier note I think there was a beautiful looking amaranthus called early splendor on her list which Derry described as having stunning deep purple leaves set off by brilliant crimson young leaves not so much about the flowers but I did think maybe I could scatter some of those at the allotment or something get, get a kind of flash of colour um, and there was a house plant and I've really not grown house plants from seed before so I'm quite interested to see probably not this year but on the wish list Seamania sylvatica with brilliant red orange tubular flowers sucker for a tubular flower yellow throats to them and shining evergreen leaves an ever blooming house plant and that is something I'm lacking is blooming house plants I've got foliage <laughs> So uh, we, we need some more flowers in here. Um, yes. <laughs> so there are two things from my Flomo list. Where are you at, Val? Well, just on the amaranthus, they're terrifically drought tolerant. They're the only annuals that did really well for me last year. On my Flomo list, I have got, I want to plant more of the allium, lavender bubbles, because I noticed um, that's, that's, um, in the, was in the plant of the year competition and it's quite low growing and it's it's not bulbous it's more I don't know rhizomatous I suppose um, but they're incredibly drought tolerant I went to visit somebody's garden and everything was dried up apart from these summer flowering alliums so I'm going to go more I'm going to order more lavender bubbles does that mean to... that its leaves didn't do that awful ugly yellow thing well no because it it it, it it, it flowers in summer. It's a summer flowering one. So the foliage is quite grassy and it stays green. And it stayed green in that dry summer. And I have got it in the garden, but I want to plant more of it. Yes. Because uh, it did do well. And the heads are globular, but they're about, they're purple, obviously, but they're about that sort of size. So, you know, like a it's a, like a giant hive, basically. <laughs> I'm sure the breeders of lavender bubbles won't thank me for that one, but... Um, I want to grow more of a short limonium um, called um, Dazzle Rock, which I tried last year, because sea lavender, I love it, and it does really well in dry summers. But the sea lavender I grow has got enormous stems and it always flops all over the lawn. 
Um, so I'm going to try the little one. But the one plant I wanted to try was a Veronica, um, a Veronica spicata. And uh, I don't know whether you know that Veronicastrum fascination. Yeah. It's yeah. tall and it's blue and it faciates. So it produces like green mermaid's tails. And I've often wondered whether the name fascination was a play on faciation, which is I when the so. flowers yeah. flatten. Because they're sort of purple and then the ends are a bit like a, a green cockade. And I just love it. And I want it, all the flowers to do it. Well, I noticed on Hayloft, they've got one called Krista, which is a short Veronica Spagata that does the same mermaid's tails thing. So I'd like to try that. That's my flow mode. Yes. I love fasciation. Um, and again, that Veronica Astrum is one of those ones that's supposed to be in my garden and somehow I've just not planted it. So it's sort of, I don't, I don't know how these plants get through the net. They slip through, but I love, it happened to um, just one of the weedy toad flaxes in my mum's garden. And I just every yes. day was endlessly fascinated by looking at those flat sort of flowers. Is your mother them. nearby? Uh, and, well, she's actually closer to Alan, really. All right. <laughs> But it's where I did all my initial gardening. So it's I just of, wondered if she was near enough to come and bail you out when it got <laughs> tricky. Well, I think an hour and a half well. is, I think an hour and a half is near enough. Yes. <laughs> and the baby will sleep in the car. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, Alan, what about your flomo? Well, I had a, uh, a single flomo, but because sitting here talking and enjoying both your companies, I have um, increased that by several more, including <laughs> Apples, Blenheim, Orange, Darcy Spice, and Pitmace and Pineapple. Um, the Generous Garden, or the rose called The Generous Garden from David Austin is going to be a must, I think. I love Beautiful the idea. Rose. Mm. I love the idea that it makes a big plant, because I do like plants that, you know, you can I, I almost, I'm going to say almost forget, but, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, leave it for a it's, couple of years to make a decent framework. It's voluptuous. Um, yes. And the <laughs> things that you learn, you see that Cordes, um, the German um, rose breeder produces healthy roses, which is mm. something I didn't know. But I mean, I've, I've heard it from the horse's mouth. It's used the part of the. <laughs> 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 um, so I, I'll take that on board. Cornus officinalis. I see. I, I don't know that. Why don't I know that? It's, it's a it's an it's a gap in my knowledge. So I've written that down. So that's another one. Um, but my flomo originally was. And this is an awkward old devil, if I can find it even. It's a delphinium. It's a double delphinium called Alice Artindale. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> can you describe it, Val? It's a sort of lavender mauve. Yeah. Um, I always think it's a bit like a cross between a delphinium and a larkspur, because for me, it's never grown very big when I've grown it. Yep. And it has these wonderful double flowers all the way up the spike, and it yep. is absolutely <laughs> beautiful. But I don't know where you would find it. No, it's just wine to grow, I believe. I've never kept it. I've never no. kept it. I've got quite a lot of... Um, um, I don't know where that... Requinii growing in pots yes. at the moment. That I've grown from seed. So I, I, that's uh, one I've been growing. So I, I, think, I think doubles... Um, don't tend to set seed. Do you, they need to be propagated. And unfortunately, we're losing all those specialist nurseries that used to propagate all these lovely things. I'm afraid so, yeah. And, and it's, I, mean, I don't are, know whether anybody's micro-poppering uh, Alice Arts. There are, there are strains of um, uh, double delphiniums today that probably are easier to grow, and that may be why there's been um, a, a demise of Alice Artindale. And I would like well, to I think it's tricky, and I think when a plant is yeah. tricky... It becomes rare. And yeah. it's as my friend Angela Tandy from Fibrex, the great fern lady, says, it's rare for a reason, Val. <laughs> because yeah. I'm always trying to grow and find rare things. And uh, they're, they're miffy quite often. Yes, they are. So yeah. I, I, good luck. I'll have a look on the internet and see if I can find any. But you probably could have done that already. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Have you found it? I, well, well, Bob. Um, Bob Brown, Cotswold Garden Flowers, he lists it, but I haven't really made any inquiries as to whether he's got it. Yes. It'd, it'd probably be, uh, but just from the fact that it is a miffy little devil, it would probably be no sorry. No, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it's going to be tricky to propagate. It's a big problem with doubles, yes, all yeah. double flowers, because they don't, uh, many of them don't set seeds. 
this um i was just potting up and dividing the other day lichnis um coronaria gardener's world which is a yes. double form and it is um sterile and the only way you can propagate it is vegetatively um so i was i always have the- to rebuy mine from um from Barnsdale Gardens, because of course Jeff Hamilton was the person who yes. popularised it, and Nick yeah. still grows it. Yeah, because it doesn't come through the winter here. Well, I have a very, very sharp, very long knife, and I stand at yes. the top of the shed, and I'm thinking, where shall I make my cut? Yes, like, exactly. like, a, like a surgeon, you know. <laughs> yes. But, but How many once you go in, you're in. <laughs> that's a lovely yeah. plant, though. I, that stopped me in my tracks. You grow it in your courtyard, do you, Alan? Uh, if, yes, it is. It's all over the place, really, actually. But I have to go around at least once a year and find some of the prosperous looking clumps and dig them yes. up, go yes. to the potting shed and then pot them individually. And I grow them then under cold glass. Yes, that's the way to do it. Um, mm. I, Being on top of the Cotswolds, we get a very harsh light up here um, and it fades colour. And I like I like um, to use garden as well because it's a burst of colour. You yeah. know, it, yeah. it it just lifts the garden, and I grew it. I, I grew it for a long time with a, a, a veronica called an, either Mariette or Marietta, which is a deep blue, and it was it was incredible. And I, I'll try to send a picture in. So um, I I do try to add it to the garden every year. Yeah. But, um, I think some of them have come through this year, but quite often I do lose them all in the winter before I get to the stage of splitting them up or trying yeah, to find probably them. the wetness isn't it well we are much wetter than you yes. yeah yeah and cold yes. it's not an easy garden here <laughs> it's a good job they've got a gardener like you gardening it really <laughs> well no not really <laughs> i'd hate well, to I... give you the impression <laughs> i was some sort of super gardener i just i just try to keep it all going basically like you know enjoy well, it that... That's any gardener. I'm just trying yes. to keep it all going. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of replanting because it's been mild. Because I, I very foolishly, before the cold weather came, I um, ordered some plants from Bressingham. And one of the things I ordered was the ginger red hot poker, um, David Blake, which is the head gardener named after his son. And I had a pot full early in the year and it wasn't very generous. It was quite a sort of hadn't rooted that well and I think I've probably lost it so I can't see it so I bought three more pots and I've been doing a lot of replanting of uh, uh, you know in gaps and I've very sadly taken up a big steeper gigantia because it was smothering everything it looked lovely but it was it was sort of knocking out three meters of garden I was losing plants all the time underneath it so I've taken it out oh. and I split it into three big clumps and on the basis I either will or it won't well uh we, we've got a, a moving job this week i finally relented and let the other half move my uh my cornice the green stemmed one baby brain has annihilated all plant names by the way i'm sorry i can't remember what anything's called anymore Vera Mira. there we are and uh and he 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 basically hates it but it's also sort of blocking his his view so we're going to move that elsewhere in the garden and i'm going to have a bit of a rejig around in my my shade bed so that's the the well, in the replanting that's happening not too much here. of a rejig <laughs> in your condition thought no i will point point and direct yes yes, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm basically completely ineffectual in the garden at the moment i just sort of well you can't bend down can you no. <laughs> you get to the stage sorry alan this is <laughs> Val, you have been a splendour as ever. Thank you so much for coming and rejoining us on Talking Dirty. It is always an enormous treat. Thank you very much for asking me. <laughs> well, lovely to see you. I mean, again, we've learned so much. Um, you've spurred my interest. You are phenomenal, um, dare I say it. At, at, um, well, I'm not going to mention your age, but I mean, you <laughs> are. I just, I just think it's wonderful that, that your enthusiasm and I mean, the light, the, the the way your face just lit up then, Val. I mean, there, look, see, it's beautiful. It's absolutely but you get the face you deserve after a certain age. <laughs> I always say when I grow up, I want to be Val Bourne. Oh, well, I, I, I went to talk to some people down, and I, the Hardy plant, and it was down at Henfield in Sussex. And I got there and... Um, 
uh, I did my talk on Sunday morning and then there was a lunch and I didn't stay very long. But the number of people that mentioned talking dirty and then the people really? who didn't know anything about it were, what on earth is this? <laughs> so it's definitely getting around. <laughs> Well, actually, I should say a big thank you to Owen the Gardener who, who shared us. He did a big sort of top 12 podcast that he likes to listen to from oh, around, lovely. The, around the world. And we made it in there. So thank you very much. Um, it, it, mm. it put a smile on our faces to, to know that, to, to, that anyone's listening. Thank you. That It makes us happy yeah. just to know you're out that's there. What, that's what I think when I'm writing. Who is <laughs> reading this? <laughs> <laughs> I think your audience might be a little bigger than ours, Val. <laughs> I'd rather be outside, but don't tell them that. <laughs> until next time, Val Iris Bourne. I already can't wait, but until then, happy gardening. Well, everybody. good luck with everything. <laughs> I need it. <laughs> it's a sort of menorah shape. I think it's menorah. Don't correct me um, <laughs> if I'm wrong. I don't really want to know. <laughs> <laughs> But we've got a few years yet then, Val, come on. Well, I'm hoping. You've both got to go on for a lot I mean, longer I, than that. I've got years of this bra on top yet. <laughs> oh, Val, you are so lovely. I'm not. Such an inspiration. There was a big groan from, from the lamp. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I had one of mine while watching Top of the Pops. <laughs> they put me in a side room, told me nothing was going to happen to the morning, sent everybody away, wheeled in a telly with Top of the Pops on, and that was it. Well, my goodness. She, she's a reprobate. I think she was influenced by the first thing she heard, probably the <laughs> Sex Pistols or something. Anyway, I think I better leave now before I say anything else about her. That's a great story. Hey.